Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Danoon Institute of Biblical Research as well as Israeli News Live. And uh, there is just something very heavy on my heart I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, and um, pardon my crackly voice here, uh, dealing with a little bit of a sinus issue there. And But I really... This is a subject that I believe is going to really resonate with everyone listening. Uh, it is the, t the attack of the enemy. Uh, on every side, I know that we are all bombarded from Satan and his devices right now. Unprecedented, you might say unprecedented in anything that we've probably any of us have ever dealt with in history uh, and as I say each one of you I'm sure can relate to what I'm saying there you feel that you're overwhelmed that the attacks are just coming from every direction um, you may feel like your neighbor doesn't like you anymore or they're doing things that are evil that are that are causing you trouble uh, you may find that your boss at work uh, has turned against you or uh, and, and you may even be feeling some of the same passionate feelings about others as well uh, you, you may be dealing with sickness you may be dealing with uh, financial hardships like never before um, you, there are so many things that are happening. You, you could just be overwhelmed with the cares of this world in ways like you've never dealt with before. Let's pray together as we get ready to start this message here because I feel like it's a very profound uh, message that I, I'm hoping will help you to understand what you're going through and what we can do to overcome it. Heavenly Father, I thank you, dear God, that we have this opportunity to, to spend with our friends here on Israeli News Live and in an Institute of Biblical Research, Lord, to share some of the insights in your word that might help, help them and comfort them to know the hour we're living in, why the troubles are upon us like never before, Lord. I pray, dear God, that you will give them the strength, the faith, the courage, and the ability to overcome every obstacle laid before them in the name above every name, the lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so I want to take, there's two scriptures I want to share with you to start with. We're going to go here to 1 Peter chapter 5, dealing with verse 7 and 8, and then we're going to look at Revelation chapter 12. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, there could be emphasis placed on as a roaring lion. In other words, he's not necessarily a lion, but he's like a lion, walking about seeking whom he, whom he may devour. But as we go into the scripture, you're going to find out that he's not just as a lion, he's actually likened unto a lion, which could give more um, credibility towards some of the other documents that were discovered back in the 40s, written that Satan was a lion-headed serpent. Kind of interesting thought there. I say that in light of the fact that when we read over in the book of Job, uh, when we read uh, where Jesus would trample the head of the uh, well, I'll just give you an example here. In the book of Psalms, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the asp, the young lion and the serpent shalt thou trample underfoot. That's what it actually says. And the very word here, kafir, is what is used instead of ari. Ari is the, um, the general term for lion, but a kafir is considered a young lion. Uh, and it doesn't matter scripturally. If you look in the book of Job, I believe it is over here, chapter 4, the roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, and the teeth of the young lions are broken. 
And it's one of the many scriptures where you can get that comparison to understand because you're using Ari uh, for lion on the first two here. But when you get to the young lion, it is the kafir. Uh, but it is clearly, it is, as scholars know, it is considered a young lion. So nonetheless, uh, I don't think Peter made any mistakes uh, you know, and it could be as a lion for the simple fact is he's not really a lion. He's something similar to that. Who knows? We won't spend so much time on that issue there. I just wanted to kind of share that with you, though, because we're going to get into this part about the trampling a little bit later as well. All right. Another scripture here, Revelation chapter 12. Uh, and we want to start here, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. That's an interesting statement in itself. We know humans inhabit the earth, but what about the sea? Who's inhabiting the sea? Hmm. Maybe when they talk about these entities that dwell in our oceans, maybe there's a problem for them as well, right? For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. That's something I really want you to focus on right there. He knows he has but a short time. It says in verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man. Not the word child, just man, mankind. Now, as we look at this Revelation chapter 12, you may find that this is encompassing 6,000 years, and that is really considered a short time. Or we could look at this, and relative to the time that we're living in now, where the scripture speaks about, you know, that, uh, that, that, that time would be shortened, you know, that he would have to cut the time short or no flesh would be saved. There's two different ways that could be looked at. And I say that in light of the fact, verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Hmm. And the earth helped the woman, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, that's you, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. By the word, if you by the way, if you have a testimony of Jesus Christ, in other words, it's his testimony of what the commandment of God is. Did you ever know that? That's an interesting thought, isn't it? They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ, in other words, his testimony, what is the commandment of God? Let's take a look at that as well. If we want to look at the testimony of Jesus Christ of what the commandment of God is, then we can look here in Matthew chapter 22. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is likened unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Remember how the scripture says they think to change the law and the times? And so often we apply that to the Catholic Church. Eh, not to say the Pope hadn't tried to do a few things like that, right? But I guarantee you one thing. There is no one that has spent more time changing the laws and justifying them than the Pharisees themselves. That's why they have a Talmud. That's why they say uh, there is more than just the Ten Commandments. There are the laws of the Pharisees, which Jesus clearly challenged if you go, and we don't, or I'm not going to spend time on that right now, clearly challenged them and said, you have heard it said of them of old times. He doesn't even give, give validity to it. 
And he talks about how you have your washing of your hands and your cups and things like that. Those traditions still go on to this day. He said, and you make the, the, the commandment of God of non-effect unto yourselves by your traditions. Yeah, they went to change the, the laws and the times. That's what it is. All right, now, my purpose, though, that I really want to focus on is the fact that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. He knows, though, remember, he knows that he has but a short time. So let's take and we'll put that into our modern period where we're at now. Even though I believe that this is encompassing that short time. Because when it says, and when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth. Wow. Satan got thrown down here. And basically he woke up and realized too, oh my gosh, I'm in a realm I don't want to be in. So he decided to make havoc. Not just for the woman but for the remnant of her seed, which is Christ, the, 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 the true believers in Jesus Christ. So if you're a true believer, I can promise you one thing. You're going to be going through trials and tribulations like you ain't never known possible, especially even now when Satan knows time is about up. And that's why you're facing these things. That's why even husband and wife are battling with one another. It's not even them. And this is, this is where a big problem comes in. We've got to be grown enough to wake up to recognize that the battle that we're facing is not our husband, it's not our wife, it's not our, our, our son, our daughter. It's not our neighbor. It's not your boss at work. And it's not to say that you're not butting heads with one another right now, but the problem is, is you're dealing with Satan who is got in there and trying to create havoc for you. And you remember the scripture says, talks about, let me just pull this up one here, the tongue, right? Tongue is, it, it can set hell on fire. Let's see if we can pull that up. Oh, goodness, where is that one at there? You remember where it says the tongue is the most unruly? Yeah, here we go, James, James chapter 3, verse 6 there. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that, that it defileth the whole body. It set it's on fire, the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and birds and serpents and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we man, which are made after the similitude of God. And out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Ought not to be, ought not so to be. So that's one of our first things we have to learn to control. And it's not easy. I, I believe me, I get it. It's not easy. Because we go through these battles in life, and, and Satan having that short time, he's seeking whom he may devour. That's his whole premise. Who can he devour? Who can, who can he totally wipe out? Whose heart can he crush? Whose nerves can he trample upon? This is what we're dealing with. This is what we're fighting against. And we have to come to a place. Sometimes the best thing to do is just keep your mouth shut. Don't argue. Don't fuss. You know, the more that we do that, the more that we're just allowing our members to become yielded to him. And I don't remember if I shared this story with you, but Bert, a good friend of mine years ago, um, he worked for uh, Joey, and I won't mention Joey's last name here, but uh, he worked for Joey. They had a uh, body shop in Pensacola, Florida. 
And Bert, boy, he would just, he had a very bad potty mouth, you'd call it, right? And I said to him one day, I said, you know, Bert, I said, you'd make a, a, an incredible Christian. He laughed. He said the church would burn down if I walked into it. And uh, I said, no, I said, I'm serious. You'd make a wonderful Christian. He said, how would you say that? I said, because you are such a great servant of the devil. I know you'd make an awesome Christian. And he kind of smirked and he says, Steve, I don't serve the devil. I just am not going to go down and go to these churches either. But I don't serve no devil. I said, yeah, sure you do. He said, what are you talking about, serve the devil? I said, look, I said, can you not, could you say the word praise God or, or thank you, Jesus, something like that? I said, sure. He said, well, yeah, I could say that if I wanted to. I said, yes. I said, but instead, though, the, bad, the worst words that could be said will come out of your mouth instead. I said, you have to yield your mouth, your tongue over to something to say either good or bad. I said, if a guy cuts you off on the road and the next thing you know, it makes you angry. And, the, and I said, what happens? I said, when you get angry, the thought comes to your head. And the next thing you know, you fly him a little finger that you show that you got a pilot's license. I said, what did you do? I said, in a split second, you yielded yourself to the thought that Satan placed in your head there. And he got you to yield your hand to fly that little finger. I said, so you're, you're, you're just, Satan just loves to toy with you. Well, that got to bothering him, right? And he comes to me, I seen him a few days later, and he says, he says to me, he says, you know how much that bothered me? He said, I don't like, I, he said, look, I, I'm not a Christian. He said, my wife's a Christian, right? I get that. He said, but I, I just don't believe one way or the other, right? He said, but I don't want to be used by a devil either. He said, and that really bugged me. He said, because I had a guy cut me off, just like you said. He said, and I was just about to give him one, buddy. He said, and suddenly I thought to myself, oh my God, no way I am not. No devil is using me to give somebody else a finger. Do you know later, I don't know how many years or so later, whatever the case was, he gave his life to Jesus Christ and became one of the most precious Christians I ever saw. I used to say that about people that did drugs too. You know, I used to say, you know, you always know which Christians would be the more, I would call it like a holy roller type of Christian, right? If you got somebody really strung out on crack and stuff like that, they get saved. They normally are the ones that are really on fire for God. You get somebody that's just a beer drinker and everything, but well, they're a little bit more mediocre and everything. It's almost like the nature that they have in the bad side is what will express in the good side, right? So it's kind of funny how that works. But anyway, going back to, to what we're talking about here, though, is that I want people, I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, that, that and whether, you, whether you're a Christian or not that are listening, because we have a lot of different people that listen to this broadcast, you're under attack like never before. And I know you are, because I know I am. I mean, I know that my family is, my wife is, my children are. We're under attack like never before. It's the same reason why when when my wife was doing these powerful messages, she was exposing the Noahide laws and exposing the evil of the New World Order into the, in so much. And this is just me personally. It's my belief. I'm not saying that I... That, that I'm 100% right on this. I did get information from Intel circles that it was true, that, that we became a target to remove, to stop the momentum that my wife was bringing forward because it was hurting the New World Order system. My father-in-law perished as a result of that. One of the sweetest men you'd ever want to know in your life. Incredible man. As a result of what happened to him and then my wife watching his suffering until his death, it totally just debilitated her. It totally changed who she was. In fact, a friend of ours that, that is a physician as well, we were sitting together discussing uh, with 
uh, an attorney about the situation that had happened. And she said it best about my wife. She said, I have known Yana. She taught my children piano and her children are all grown now. I've known her for more than 20 years. And she said, the woman sitting here before you now is not the same woman that I knew for the past 20 years. You could physically see the change in what had happened to her. Why? Because Satan, this demonic entity, is out there to destroy her with everything he possibly can. And not just destroy her, but destroy us. Destroy our family. First, he tried to take our lives physically because my wife, my father-in-law, and myself were all given a deadly injection. An injection given by a doctor that only two months before that stated in an interview with another doctor the more accurate protocol for peroxide intravenously. Interesting. But when they came to our home, five times greater. One of their own colleagues in, that, in the circle that they are in now said to me, the difference in what is considered poison or a help is in the dosage. And she acknowledged that it was deadly. All right, I say that, and I don't want to kind of get focused in that direction, but what I'm trying to get you to understand is that, and even with that, my father passing away, and then his attorney, his people that work for him and stuff, came against me. I had to have attorneys dealing with that in my dad's last part of his life. My, my grandchildren, his great-grandchildren that adored and loved him, and my kids as well, you know, we were cut off from being able to see my dad for more than a year. Satan just attacking. Not just attacking to hit you personally like that, but he's also, what is he doing? Trying to consume your time with things that, that of this life and this earth that do not even matter. I don't want to, have to spend all my time with a bunch of attorneys, although I have to say God gave me some very incredible attorneys. Very credible. I'll just say first names, Lois and Scott. But remarkable people and believers. And so in one way, you know, your, your path may cross another path of another life and it can be a blessing as a result. But at the same time, you know, Satan is just working at every angle that he possibly can. And then I may say, but you know, my wife and her condition and everything, I can say something that's offensive and, and, and I may not mean it, but it could be something that just devastates her. See, and then Satan is just working in both sides, every direction. And you no doubt are going through very similar circumstances. Sister Elizabeth, who helps us in this ministry, she does the translation work. She just like Brother Charles there on Twitter, you know, and, and, and then I've got Sister Rosa, you know, they'll send me information, helping me every way you can. And I and because I have close relationships with them, now Brother Charles, he doesn't share his personal life with me there, but like in the case of Elizabeth or Sister Rosa there, or, or, or even uh, Sister Brenda, uh, a very precious sister up in Georgia that I love uh, dearly, we, we, my wife as well. You know, we know the intricacies of their lives and the things that they have suffered and even suffer now and the attacks like never before. And sadly, if they help us and everything, it seems like they're even become more of a target. And then there is a, there is a friend of Elizabeth's that I know that, that there's a connection with Hillary Clinton and Hillary Clinton and their little demonic entities are just trying to destroy this woman's life like never before. And so I'm, I'm sharing this with you because I realize that 
I, I know it's not just us. It's you as well that are under an attack like never before. And especially when it comes right down to the family, when it comes down to the intricacy of the family, that's where Satan really begins to work for the destruction. So think about what you say to your loved one. Be careful with the words that you use. I want to share some more, though, with you scripturally on these things, right? And of course, right here, love your neighbor as yourself. You ever notice, though, if you did what he said here, love your Lord God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And the second is like to do it, love your neighbor as yourself. If you kept those two commandments there, all 10 commandments are fulfilled. Because you won't covet, you won't lust, you won't, you won't do any of these things, right? And by the way, that's another thought too, and I need to deal with maybe a separate message on this subject here. But you men that, that, that are struggling, and maybe this is another one that you're under right now, struggling with lust. You may be married, or you may not be married, but you, you, you just have it. You're just being bombarded with temptations for this woman, that woman, whatever the case may be. And it just seems unrelenting. First off, you have to recognize The, the thoughts that come to your head are not your own. If you can get to a place to where you, because that's normally how it starts. Now, eventually what happens when you begin to yield to that thought and you yield to it over and over and over and over, then you kind of make it your own. But I can tell you one thing, it never started out that way. And you got to go back to where you went off at. And I, and I will say this too for you you men that go through this, and there are women that go through that as well. Please don't get me wrong. I know that for a fact. There are women that suffer the same thing that men do. You don't see it as common in women though. They normally don't have that type of an issue. Satan kind of attacks them in a different direction. But one of the things that you can do a lot of times too is you can go in there and you can... If you, you know, this, remember how the scripture says, you know, confess your faults one to another. The reason why, the, why God writes that in his word, that's to break the bond of Satan. Because if you're secretly doing things, especially if you've gotten into pornography or something like that, it's not the end of the world for you. But now, when I say confess your faults one to another, as the scripture says there, you know, don't go to somebody that's got the same problem. So you got to really be careful who you say that to, because if they've got the same problem, then this, that same spirit that's tormenting you is tormenting the other one. And you just kind of, next thing you know, they kind of help one another and you stay in the same bondage. You can't get free. But what does the confessing your false one to another do? It breaks the bond of Satan. See, Satan doesn't want exposed what's going on. And it may be a situation to where maybe the best person to confess it to is your wife, especially if it's you've sinned against her. Now, it doesn't mean that every thought that comes to your head, you got to go confess to your wife. Oh, honey, I had this thought here today. Oh, honey, I had that thought today. No, no, no. You just tear her all apart. Because thoughts that come to your head are not your own to start with. Satan has that ability. In fact, uh, one of the best places was in one of the writings that were found over in Egypt there that I that I had discovered there where it talks about, and we know this to be true because we see the maniac of Gadaria. You know, the demons can really get a hold of your body. But in this one here, and I forget how it was written though, but it talks about how the, the demons can get control of your flesh, your thoughts, your mind, and inject thoughts in there. And even through government things, we know that demonic entities, we just call it energy forces, what they call it in the government. But the, the Christians know they can see as demonic entities affecting the people on the earth. Because remember, Satan has but a short time and he's seeking whom he may devour. Totally engulf you, swallow you up. And by the way, I don't think that that means 
that he's just coming to eat you as a, you know, you know, for his own diet. I think he's talking about to take control of you. Your entire being is what he wants. All right, let's see here where I got. I've got some things I wanted to share with you. Oh, this is a good one too. I need to come back to this one here, Matthew. The Hebrew Matthew. And you got to get down to the, to the truth of the matter. There's just flat out people that are on this planet that appear to be human that are not. And in the Hebrew Matthew, and I'm going to read it real quick while we're here, and then we'll, I'll find the other one I'm looking for. The Pharisees were quick to hear this and said, this one does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the Lord of demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them in a parable, every kingdom among you divided shall be made desolate. And so every city or house upon which division shall fall shall not stand. If Satan cast out another Satan, there will be a division among them. How will his kingdom stand? Then watch what he says in verse 27. In the Greek, you don't quite see it because they, they kind of throw one word in there different. But in the Hebrew, and it does say it in the Hebrew as well, what I'm fixing to read to you clearly identifies the truth. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, why do your sons not cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. You see, Jesus came down and could cast out the devils because they were not of his kingdom to begin with. So it didn't divide his kingdom. But he says to them, why do your sons not cast them out? The reason the Pharisees and Sadducees couldn't cast out the devils out of the people is because that was part of their kingdom. Remember the scriptures where Jesus says over in John, uh, the gospel of John, you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's word. Yet there you therefore hear them not because you are not of God. So couple that back around when he says, but if I cast out the demons by the spirit of God, truly the end of his kingdom has, has come, right? But he says to them, why do your sons not cast them out? Because that was part of their kingdom and they didn't want their kingdom to fall. If they were to start casting out the devils out of the, out of the people and everything, <clears throat> then the Pharisaic dynasty would come crumbling down. Hmm. Interesting, right? All right, let's see here. Um think oh by the way this is another one too where satan is thrown down to earth job chapter two again i tell of I, again it fell upon a day that the sons of god came to present themselves before the lord and satan came also among them to present himself before the lord and the lord said unto satan from where uh, uh come you and Satan answered the Lord and said, from him going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. That is just proving that Satan had been thrown out to the earth here is what the point was on that right there. Um, here we go. This is when Jesus is going through the temptation in the wilderness. I'll start with verse four. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil takes him up into the holy city and sits him on a pinnacle of the temple. And by the way, just as a reminder, I read the scripture, I try to make sure I use modern English so that when we translate, if, if we translate the particular message I'm doing in other languages, it doesn't confuse the language translator uh, because if I use biblical uh, verbiage, uh, such as setteth, et cetera, things like that, it has a harder time translating that. Going on to verse 6, and says unto him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, 
and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you, at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Hmm. Right? Interesting. Now, that comes from, uh, from Isaiah. Now, this is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's actually written pretty much the same way in the... Uh, in the, uh, let's see here. Thought I could blow that up. I guess not. Anyway, <clears throat> it's also written the same way in the book of Psalms, chapter 91. The dread of the night of the arrow that flies by day. The plague that rages at noon or the pestilence that is in darkness proceeds. A thousand will fall at your side, 10,000 at your right. But you, it shall not strike. Only look with your eyes and you shall see the retribution of the wicked ones. You have invoked your shelter, his happiness, not will you see, excuse me, uh, not will you see evil and not will a plague strike in your tents. For his commandments, his angels, or excuse me, for he has commanded his angels concerning you to safeguard you on your paths. They shall lift up lift you upon their palms so that your foot does not trip on a stone. Upon a viper and an asp shall you step and you will trample lion and dragon. All right. You have loved the Lord or Yahweh and he will rescue you and protect you and show you his salvation. Now the thing is here, Jesus is going to pass that on to us as well. And it would make sense that he does, because let me go back to it real quick. Notice what it says here. Not will you see evil, not will a plague strike in your tents, plural. For he has commanded his angels concerning you to safeguard you and your paths. They shall lift you upon their palms so that your foot does not trip on a stone and upon a viper and an asp shall you step. You will trample lion and dragon. But that strikes in your tents. So the tents plural because we are in Christ, a collective body of believers. Now, let me take you to Psalm 91 uh, where we actually have it biblically here. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh uh, your tent. Now, in this one here, we have it in the singular. And I will have to go back because in the Hebrew, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's in the plural. For he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you upon their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And you shall tread upon the lion and ass, the young lion and the serpent shall you trample underfoot. The young lion and the dragon. Now, and before, I'm, I'm going to come back to this in just a second from the Dead Sea Scrolls. We'll look at that in just a moment here. In the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, we read this here. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, he doesn't just say that for no reason. He says it for a reason because he's letting you know he's on the earth. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So we have also been given the power to trample under our feet the enemy himself. You have power through your faith in Jesus Christ that the enemy cannot rule over your life and take control and to trample you to nothing. If by your own faith in Jesus Christ that he gave you this authority, you know, regardless of what he may throw at you right now, you have the ability to overcome it. 
The thing is, is you need to believe it. Now, I want to go back to this one in the Dead Sea Scrolls here. So just get, bear with me one moment here. Okay, so let's see here. Now, let me, I'll tell you what before I go, but let me come back here real quick. All right. So we're looking right here. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh thy tent uh, or, or near your tent, your house, whichever one you want to call it there. That's actually the word tent is exactly right. And this is it right here in Hebrew. All right. It is singular in the Masoretic version of that particular passage. But if you go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, right, and this is the where I was, I was reading here from verse 10 for you. Let me find it here. Here we go right here. Now they translate it as, I don't know if it'll, yeah, it won't highlight, strike you in your tents, plural. So just out of curiosity, I go up here, and I wanted to look to be sure. That's what I wanted to share that with you. Uh, and we do have it here. In your tents. And that yod right in there. That little yod right there. Well, you don't even get to see it. Let me, let me highlight the Lamed Yod Chet. The yod is added in there. Which is tent. That would, that would pluralize it in Hebrew by adding a yod. But it's actually speaking of him specifically in a singular. In your tents. So, and this of course is an older version than the Masoretic version. So why did they take out the pluralization of tents? Hey, I don't know. But it's fascinating though, because if we look at what we have here, and we, we see um, what's going on. And hang on. Uh, I apologize, friends, there. We see what's going on right there. That it's pluralized. I, I, I find it, it's all, okay. <laughs> getting distractions and I apologize for that there uh, but l l let me just slow down just for a moment because you really got to see this here it's important that we realize the correction because here there shall no evil befall you neither shall any plague come uh, near your tent your house your body for he will give his angels charge over you right now, and of course, true, in a singular, that would apply to Jesus Christ. But what's, what's interesting is without the correction of that being tense, plural, then there would be no way. Uh, and let me find it. It's over in the book of Luke. Where do I have Luke at? Come on. Where is that? Luke's on the screen here. We are right here. There would be no way for Jesus to be able to pass on this prophecy to us without that correction there. See, because watch what he says. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, notwithstanding, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So, Jesus, in verse 18, acknowledges that Satan has thrown down here to the earth. He said he saw it when it happened. And, and I don't realize how beautiful, if you realize, this is right here. But a, a little yod found in the Dead Sea Scrolls right here in, the ten, in, in your tents, and, he, and it pluralized it, shows that in the prophecy of the book of Psalm that David actually prophesied, not only did he prophesy about Christ, but it prophesied about the tents, plural, being the body of Christ, would also benefit 
from this same prophecy. And therefore, when Jesus over in the Gospels, Luke there gives, he says, I will give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. It was because the prophecy in Psalm 91 in the original version of that prophesied that we would get it as well. And that to me is absolutely incredible. I mean, that is incredible. I didn't know this before I started this, by the way, either. This is just incredible. It makes it more powerful. You know, so, you know, the Masoretic version here, you got to remember the Masoretic version is about 400 years, maybe 500 years, I forget exactly when we got this version of the Bible after Jesus Christ. So the Dead Sea Scrolls version over here is actually done, written before Jesus came on the earth. And it is quoting Psalm 91. And I thank God for the translators because I don't always go and double check everything that I'm reading on there, but they actually put it in there. They, they actually have it translated correctly. Uh, will, will you see evil and not will a plague strike in your tents? Okay. A plague won't strike in your tents. Wow. So all the things that are coming upon this earth, the evils, not just the fact of the demons and the devils anointing and causing strife and hardship in your life, but these plagues that are coming upon the earth. They got some nasty ones coming. If you take and look over on iConnectFX.com, we have a video there because you may have not have caught it when we did the 30 second clip. I talk about that. They got some more coming. And who's doing it? Satan. He knows he has but a little time. Think about all the people in Ukraine. It doesn't matter if they're Russian, Ukrainian, or whatever. People are losing their lives on a daily basis over there. For what? Because Satan knows he has but a short time. He's trying to end lives. If you're in Ukraine, and there are people in Ukraine both sides of this war that listen to this broadcast. I want to encourage you to go deeper in your love for Jesus Christ than you ever have. Embrace your brethren over there. Don't, don't what I mean, brother against brother, Slav against Slav. Even in, in Israel, those that are listening tonight in Israel, do you realize the Palestinian people there Many of them are your brothers. Love them. Show kindness to them. And, and Palestinian uh, friends, show kindness to, the, to, to your Israeli brothers. Because why? Satan is about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's pitting you against one another. And if he can't get it that way, he'll send disease to you. He will manufacture it. He'll do whatever he has to do to try to bring you down. That's what's prophesied. But the beauty of it is, evil will not will, will a plague strike in your tents. So Jesus was able to pass that promise on to us. We are more than conquerors in him, in Christ Jesus. So I want to encourage you with these things. I want you to know that God has made you more than a conqueror. And then we will see it fulfilled the very scripture. And you shall tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. That's Malachi in the King James chapter 4, verse 3. In the Hebrew version, chapter 3, I don't know what verse it is, and chapter 3 there goes way on down there. You shall tread down the wicked. The Tanim, the dragons, the Nachashim, the serpents. For they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. Friends, I really pray that this has been a blessing for you today. And I just want to thank you for listening. 
I want to remind you of our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. I'm thinking about actually starting to write posts again myself. My wife had talked about doing that as well. Uh, some of the latest ones were from her. Uh, very, very, especially the threat of a newly formed right-winged Israeli government, a warning to Christians. Very powerful message that she did there. Um, but if you want to support the work we do, and God lays that upon your heart, we thank you in advance. Uh, right above my head is also the website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. Uh, our mailing address, Stephen Ben Noon at P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. That's also right here on the website. You can do it either under my name or Danoon Institute. Or you can just click right online. Uh, and you'll be able to go and donate automatically. It's just right there. Uh, even though it is a PayPal link, it does not matter if you use any kind of credit card you want. We just thank you for your kindness and support to help us out there. Um, Anyway, God bless you, we love you, and have a blessed day.